Welcome to the full name of the panel here. Uh, the New Normal, How to Ethically Expand Access to Technology. Um, I'm here with these uh, wonderful panelists and all of you. Thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, my name is Danya Glavo. I, uh, I will start with a little introduction of myself. We'll do some intros here um, and then uh, shift into a short discussion here among the panelists. And then we're gonna turn it over to you, um, have you talk to your friends and neighbors uh, in the room, and then we'll have a, a kind of exchange uh, between the room and those of us up here. And then we'll wrap up on one final uh, question and uh, just a moment for plugs uh, for different projects we're working on, different things uh, we're looking for help for. Uh, so, um, and that will be our hour. Um, so uh, again, I'm Danya Glavo. <clears throat> I am an anthropologist uh, uh, by training. Uh, I do a bunch of things uh, uh, as uh, uh, in the rest of my life. Uh, so I'm here uh, with my colleague and friend John David Brown. Um, we co-organize a meetup group called QX, Queer Experience, um, that uh, looks at uh, dimensions of uh, queer culture uh, and the intersections with technology and design. I also teach social science, social science engineers at NYU Tandon School of Engineering. So uh, woohoo to all the students out there. Thanks for making it out on a Saturday. Um, and finally, I run a, a small consulting group called Implosion uh, Labs. We work uh, with healthcare and technology companies, ethnography-driven research. So I'm just going to pass this down for intros to get us started. Hi, everyone. That's right. It doesn't work. I'm supposed to hold it down here. This is so confusing when you're a UX person, which is what I am. Um, so I'm a UX designer. Um, I uh, got my start uh, very early in the Valley in the 90s. Um, cut my teeth pretty early there on some great companies, including eBay, which uh, you guys no doubt just heard about. Um, and uh, moved to New York a few years ago to, to focus on other things. I've worked for companies such as Friendster, um, EA, uh, and have worked for agencies as well, which is a very different experience. I'm now working for myself, um, which I love to do. Um, and I have a lot of opinions about the tech industry, I'm not going to lie, and I hope to share them today. <laughs> Hi, my name is John David. Um, as Donya mentioned, she and I are involved with QX. Um, that's a project that we've been starting. It's an event series um, that we're hoping to transform into a lot of different things. Um, but my background is I'm a product manager at a company called Merrill Corp. It's not any of the minerals that you've heard of. Um, and basically, they create the platforms that banks and companies use for mergers and acquisitions. Um, so they account for something like 40% of the global M&A transactions every year. A bit dry, I know. Uh, trust me, I know. Um, uh, and I'm not doing God's work. I know that, too. But, uh, but what I've been tasked with doing is to, <laughs> I mean, how many of us are truly doing God's work? But um, what I've been tasked with doing is creating their first mobile app. So it's very similar to sort of a Google Drive type thing. And yeah, that's sort of what I've been doing for the past several years. I build mobile apps. So I've built them for American Express, Saks Fifth Avenue, some startups, and now banking. <laughs> so. Hi, um, I'm Ariba Jahan. I am the Director of Innovation at the Ad Council. So for those of you that may not know, the Ad Council is the largest nonprofit in the US that uh, leverages the power of communication to create social change in the face of really pressing issues. We have over 35 social good campaigns, anything ranging from shelter pet adoption to LGBT um, rights awareness and suicide prevention. And we focus on creating um, attitudinal and behavioral shifts. Um, by creating integrated 360 campaigns, which is really including everything from digital, social, media, um, out of home, TV, radio, and sometimes emerging technologies. And um, my role there uh, has two main focuses. One is creating a really strong pulse on the emerging tech and emerging trends out there to see what are some good signals um, and how, to, how can that inform our work, as well as um, infusing design thinking and lean startup methodologies throughout our uh, culture and our work so that we have um, a, a mindset shift towards experimentation and challenging assumptions. Um, my background comes from biomechanical engineering, then medicine, and then startups, and then products, and then blah, blah, blah. Here I am. So that's it. 
Great. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, so I want to start uh, as a moderator. I'm going to take a little bit of liberty to start with some comments. And we're going to start with um, some more uh, definitional, uh, a, a sort of definitional conversation up here. Um, but before we even do that, I also just want to point out sort of what we're talking about today together, right, this ethical tech summit. I think we've been largely talking about digital technologies, mobile technologies, computing technologies. Um, and I just, I, I think it might come up in our conversation that we're also talking about built infrastructure and built technologies, physical technologies, as well either as case studies or analogies to um, some of the digital conversations that we're having together. Um, and so I just wanted to share a kind of definition of technology that I really like to have in the back of my mind in these kinds of conversations. Uh, coming from science fiction writer Ursula K. Uh, Le Guin in a short essay called A Rant About Technology where she kind of uh, pushes back against uh, some of her critics. Um, and she says, she has a very expansive uh, idea of technology. Maybe we can have that in the background of our conversation. She says, um, it's technology is how a society copes with physical reality how people get and keep and cook food, how they clothe themselves, what their power sources are, animal, human, water, wind, electricity, what they build with and what they build, their medicine, and so on and on. Perhaps very ethereal people aren't interested in these mundane bodily matters, but I'm fascinated by them and I think my readers are too. In other words, she goes on to say, technology is an active human interface with the world. So I think a lot of the conversation we've been having today around ethics, we've been talking about how do we get active in doing ethics and building ethics into our organizations, our products, our jobs, our activities, our world views. Um, and, and I like this sort of framing as technology as a way to actively interface with the world, right? Whether it's the physical world, the built world, the digital world, or the people world as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there to start. Um, and then getting into um, some conversational points. Um, so, um, so, right, this, this conversation, I think we're going to try to bring together um, ideas about ethics and technology, um, but also access to technology. Um, and I don't know that these are always sort of obviously put together as similar questions or as questions um, that um, overlap, um, but we're going to try to do that here. Um, and so I think for me, when I think about um, access and ethics, one of the points where I see them overlapping is um, potentially around conversations of uh, bias, right? Whether it's uh, algorithmic bias in uh, digital uh, technologies, right? We're seeing uh, many examples of that um, with uh, people, um, uh, black people misclassified as uh, apes in uh, Google's uh, 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 computer vision algorithms. Um, we're seeing that with the differential impact that decision-making algorithms in criminal justice uh, and in social services services uh, provision uh, has on people uh, by race but also by income uh, in different parts of uh, the country. Um, and so um, for me, what connects ethics and access um, uh, is potentially a question of, of bias, right? Um, and sort of um, the, the biases or the, social, the socially patterned differences in who, have ac who has access to different technologies or technological systems um, and how that maps onto their actual life chances, right? Their, their possibilities for flourishing, which I see as a, a question uh, that is very deeply uh, ethical. So um, with that said, you know, that's how I'm thinking about connecting these two things, access and ethics. And I'd love to hear from the panelists, I know they all have lots of thoughts about this, about um, other ways that they see ethics and access uh, being connected. Um, and in particular, can we um, sort of collectively in this room together really work towards reframing access, the, uh, maybe the ability to use technology, uh, the having the infrastructure to be able to access technology, all the many ways, uh, having the um, uh, accessibility features built into technological systems so that they're accessible to many different kinds of users. Um, and many other examples we'll talk about here. So how can we reframe access as an ethical issue or even as potentially an ethical imperative for technologists, designers, and others in our space here today? So I wonder if one of the easiest ways for us to sort of connect these things together is to think about it in the physical world and actually in our, our old history. So colonialism, right? So colonialism comes in, we go into third world countries, we try and implement um, different methods or different offerings for that particular audience, but they never get to really experience the fullness of that particular uh, main culture that came in. 
What we're seeing right now with companies like Facebook five years ago, with internet.org, where they thought that they were going to save the world by putting the internet out there, but by the way, you're going to get basic internet, and you're only going to get a little bit of Facebook, and what a surprise, the pieces of Facebook that you were going to get were probably not the ones that were going to cover off on privacy and security, right? That, my friends, is digital colonialism at its best. Um, they were then forced to pivot five years later, um, so the pressure was on, but that only happened because the people within those countries, let's say India, um, fought back and said, enough already, you can't do this, there must be a better way. So we had to reteach Facebook and what to do. So that's, that's how I'm looking at things currently, um, is taking a look at what our history is, um, what we've done as mankind, and figuring out uh, where we can learn uh, without this whole old moving, fast-breaking things, which sounds really dumb. Um, and actually just focusing on uh, doing the right thing by having conversations ahead of time. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I've got a lot of thoughts, but I guess we'll keep them broad for this question. Um, I guess whenever I started thinking about technology and access, um, the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that, you know, is the internet. So that's how I sort of look at it uh, from my own perspective, right? I build apps that use the internet. Um, and that's sort of a requirement for the apps. And so that dichotomy of something being free and available to everybody, asterisk, who can afford it, um, is one thing. And then, you know, uh, as people continue to rely on digital tools uh, to get access to, you know, critical services, um, using their GPS for a lot of different things, being able to validate identity through you know, video and all of this, that's all wonderful, but when, when will that depart what a lot of people in the world have access to? Like, it's going to be a severe division, perhaps. Um, so we can think a lot about how we could mend that, but that's definitely a reality. Um, and yeah, I think that uh, the, I was reading a thing, the, the co-founder of Apple, whose name I forgot, like most people probably, Mike Mc Kula, something like that. Does anybody know? Anyway, um, he he gave a pretty cool uh, perspective about it, and sort of saying like everybody has access to the internet; it should be free and available. Um, uh, but yeah, and, and he was talking specifically about the ethics around it. So saying that.